There's often been a gap, really, between industry and government, between those who are leading the political process of Brexit and those who are living the consequences of it. What, what in the report would you single out? We're going to talk it more in more length later. But what would you really single out as a kind of key message, key takeaway of this report? I think the most important message is we've left the European Union, but we're still 22 miles away from Europe. Europe is still our biggest, nearest and most important trading and indeed political partners. And we've got to start building a new relationship. It will be different from the one we had before, but we've got to put the politics of Brexit behind. I'm afraid it hasn't yet disappeared and ask the new question, which is how can we make trade for both sides easier? Because it's in the interests of both the UK and 
the European Union, given the extent of trade between us. And it's then a question of focusing on the individual items, whether it's cost, bureaucracy, red tape, which has affected British businesses, or the impact on SMEs, or questions of divergence or alignment, because the more you move away from EU rules, the more complicated it's going to be for British businesses. And making it easier for people to travel to provide services, look at the issue of artists and performers who are facing a nightmare because that wasn't part of the agreement that was negotiated by the government. So it's lots of very important specific recommendations that are all based on trying to answer the question, how can we make it easier for businesses to trade? I mean, these are here points to a kind of larger question now, which is that the TCA was done, Lord Frost negotiated it, Boris Johnson signed it. In order for any of these recommendations to be useful or even interesting, we have to see the TCA, don't we, as something that can evolve. Are you confident it can evolve? And if so, how would you like to see it um, based on this report? How would you like to see it evolving? I think what's interesting is that of course, everyone expects it to evolve, in, in, including the government, including possibly those people such as Lord Frost, who negotiated it in the first place and then seemed to be very prepared to negotiate some of its, its, its basic principles out of existence. It's possibly the, the way that it needs to evolve and in whose favour and for which purpose it evolves. That's what's critical now. And what we heard over and over again from the very beginning, I think, with the sessions that we had, I'm thinking of the, of the British Chambers of Commerce, that um, this is a, an absolute sea change. And that government now needs to take it very seriously in the way that they approach the nature of the negotiations that they're holding with our you know, the EU nations, our nearest neighbour. My nearest capital city, of course, from my, where I live in my constituency, is, is, is Dublin. Yeah. By a very, very, very considerable difference compared to how, how long it takes to get here to London. But the, the nature of the politics in which we engage, you know, it's been brought into sharp focus in the, in the present, the, 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 the and now, with our government's relationship now with the EU, previously Article 16 was being threatened as something that could be used as, as a political tool, if you like, not as something that was very, very significant to the nature of the relationship that we would have in future. That sort of relationship has got to, frankly, grow up. We're not talking about populist politics. This is the nature of our relationship, our trading relationship with our nearest neighbour. This is particularly significant for Wales. Obviously, I represent Plaid Cymru here in, in, in Westminster and here today. 60% um, of our exports go to the EU. That's higher than, than other regions and nations of the United Kingdom. So the nature of our relationship has got to adapt. The, one of the recommendations in, in the report talks about was that the need to constantly renegotiate with the trade and cooperation agreement. That is self-evident. We need to be evolving this as we go along. And I think in the final point that we really need to be aware of is, is, is also the relationship, again, with the devolved governments, that this has, again, it's been a politics of adversarialism. Mm -hmm. we, we need to grow up out of this sort of politics. This is the way that our economies and our communities will actually thrive. And presently, in the Internal Market Act, as it stands, that's actually perceived quite reasonably as being a threat. It's an interesting, it's an interesting area, and we will get onto that because I think um, there's two sets of ad, ad, adversarialism. There's the, there's the macro one between the UK and the EU, which is driven in large part by Northern Ireland and the issues over Northern Ireland. And then there is this issue about where the British government is using some of the competences that it took back from Brussels. Um, I think, as uh, you know, as lots of people I talk to in Cardiff and Edinburgh would say, to drive a coach and horses through elements of the devolution settlement. And I think it's going to be an interesting thing coming up with structural funds and the way, which we might talk about later, actually, the way structural funds are going to be replaced with this UK shared prosperity fund. First things first, this is a relationship, managing a relationship between the UK and the EU. Do you credit Liz Truss for actually uh, improving the mood somewhat um, between the UK and the EU, it seemed to me that Lord Frost made a virtue out of, you know, fisticuffs. You know, when I talk to people in Brussels, I do feel a recognition that Liz Truss, who's now in control of this or in command of this relationship, has at least um, set a different tone, even before the Ukraine crisis. Well, the relationship couldn't have been much more macho and adversarial as it was under the, um, the control or whatever of, of Lord Frost. I think, well, I, I would... I have no reason whatsoever not to credit Liz, Liz Truss with the changes. I think the external uh, situation, again, to refer to Ukraine, actually meant everybody's mind has had to be focused. Is that we, we, this is not 
the game in town now. We, we're going to have to get on with something else, and the, the need for a closer, uh, more cooperative arrangement, a more um, fraternal relationship, if you like, between between the UK and the EU has just become so evident that it would be impossible to ignore. Yeah. Hilary, um, you and I and, and several other commissioners were in Belfast um, the week before last in a, in a really fascinating trip that wasn't about the politics of unionism or the, or the protocol. It was a real deep dive, wasn't it, into um, the substance of how businesses are dealing with the protocol. Now, one of the reasons why, or perhaps not one, the primary reason why so many other Brexit files are stuck between London and Brussels is that Brussels sees the UK trying to renege on its treaty commitment, which was that we avoided returning a border north-south in Ireland by agreeing that Northern Ireland, which is part of the United Kingdom, would remain in the EU single market for goods, not for services, but for goods. And that required the creation of a border in the Irish Sea. And you know that has caused friction and difficulties for, for businesses and what have you. So whilst we can say Liz Truss uh, you know, has improved the mood and has stopped the kind of fisticuffs that we saw from Lord Frost, we have a substantive problem here, don't we, which is that the UK and the EU seem to have fundamentally different conceptions of what that deal, the Northern Irish Protocol, means. After the trip, how confident are you that we can find a resolution to these problems, without which I dare say we're going to struggle to move forward on all the other things that we're going to talk about in a minute? What, what was your, what, what, where are we at with that? Well, I think it certainly opened all of our eyes to the sheer complexity of what is being grappled with in Northern Ireland. Look, the, the problem is essentially this. In negotiating the protocol, um, the two sides did not resolve the central question, which revolves around the words, goods at risk of entering the European Union. It didn't define them. And the starting point of the EU is all goods are potentially at risk unless you can prove they're not. And the position of the UK government now is none of them are at risk unless you can prove to me that they are. Well, the obvious solution is to meet somewhere in the middle. And the Commission, in fairness, has moved on medicines, for example. Mr. Sefcovic, and credit to him, he realised it was quite impossible to say to NHS patients in Northern Ireland, I'm really sorry, you can't get NHS medicines shipped over from GB to treat your cancer or other condition. And the EU changed its law. So it's shown to move away from the rules is the rules, which is the starting position, to find a compromise. And that is what we now need, but it requires the right politics. And I think Liz put a finger on it when she talked about growing up, because the government says, Brexit is done, I got Brexit done, but continues to want to have a punch up because, let's be blunt, the Prime Minister thinks having a fight with the EU is good politics for him. It's not, and it's certainly not good for Northern Ireland because the other thing we heard was that there's a lot of businesses who look at the protocol and think, well, this is wonderful for the future of Northern Ireland because, of course, Northern Ireland is able to trade with both markets. So in a world where businesses thought the protocol is here to stay and while there's talk about getting rid of it or changing it or amending it, it creates uncertainty well, and business hates it. I didn't hear a single business we spoke to, large or small, say they wanted to get rid of the protocol. No, indeed. Did you, did there, you, are, there are certain businesses that are affected by it and yeah. want it to be applied in what they regard as a rational way. Yeah. And I think we would all support that. But the opportunity for investment, because the moment business is persuaded overall that this is here to stay, you want to sell to both markets, where's the best place to invest? Northern Ireland. So it is in the interest of Northern Ireland to resolve this, to make the protocol stable, but it requires politics to move on from the Brexit punch-up, and both sides have got to meet somewhere in the middle. And frankly, the sooner they do that, the better. And I also agree completely with what you said, Liz, about um, the impact that war in Europe is having. Because why are we arguing about customs checks and fish and other things when Europe is in the grip of its greatest crisis for many, many decades? We need to be cooperating with our European neighbours to help Ukraine and deal with the security challenges we face. Liz, you'd agree with that. I mean, in terms of the raw politics, as Hillary says, Boris Johnson has frequently... Um, 
used the Brexit reflex. It was really interesting to me that when he was absolutely on the ropes in the heat of party gate, when he made that dreadful remark, well, dreadful in my view, remark about, about uh, Jimmy Savile, um, it was interesting to me that, that, that he kept repeating, we got Brexit done, in defending his record and defending himself. So there is this Brexit reflex. Do you think, which, which, is, which is, I think, as Hillary says, made it harder and harder to kind of code it, to solidify the deal on Northern Ireland. Do you think that changes now post-Ukraine, that actually maybe there's less in there for Boris Johnson to kind of play that hard Brexit, let's be, have this to discuss with Brussels card? I would like to think that the, the hard reality, Hillary, as you said, I mean, the, the reality of, of, of war in Europe will, then let's do some people some favors here, will enable the prime minister to move away from the sort of politics, which is basically a discussion within the Conservative Party as to, you know, Brexit was the one thing that we needed to do to sort ourselves out as the Conservative Party. We've done that now. That isn't what matters. That's not the point of politics. It's not the point of being a prime minister or a party in governance. What you should be doing is making sure that businesses in the United Kingdom, we're threatening, you know, we're facing a massive economic threat at present. I know that there are senior conservatives who fear that we're going into the biggest recession that we'll have seen in possibly in generations. We don't need the sort of politics that is relying on that sort of oh, he said, she said, sort of approach. We now need to have a, the boring, solid governance of how do you go around making the best decisions with at least a degree of consensus upon it. And that works in our relationships with Europe, but it also works in the relationships within the devolved governments as well, because that tension is not making for, pe to, for the improvement, the betterment of people's lives on the ground. And I think we are all, all of us going to face this. You know, politics is no longer a spectator sport. It exists for a reason. The reason is to improve people's lives. If it continues to do something which is just for, for the tip to tap, for the game of it, then it has spectacularly failed. And as the cost of living crisis bites, it's, you know, it's going to look more and more unedifying if, if we're having ideological squabbles rather than... Yeah. Nonetheless, and we, I promise you, we're not going to spend this entire discussion talking about Northern Ireland, but we are, it's so fundamental, I think, to unblocking the process in Brussels that, that's why I think we need to dwell on it. Nonetheless, there is a big technical problem, which is that Northern Ireland is in the EU single market for goods. So we were in a um, supermarket distribution depot where you've got lorry loads of goods coming over, two and a half thousand items in each truck, ready-made meals made with beef from Brazil, um, all sorts of rules, which if it was going into the EU, which is the EU single market for goods, it would be subject to all sorts of controls. Now, at the moment in Northern Ireland, there's all these grace periods running where the full panoply of checks that you see on goods going from Great Britain into the EU is not applied. Now, Hillary, we, um, we, we heard, didn't we, testimony from the, the supermarkets, several supermarkets, talking about what, how impractical it would be if they were having to apply full single market rules on goods going from Great Britain to Northern Ireland. And one of the things they suggested was, well, the EU should recognise UK standards as equivalent to EU standards for goods going into Northern Ireland. And I think that's a big ask for the Commission. So my question to you is, in the absence of a kind of hard-edged technical solution, how do we get over the hump of the Northern Ireland problem. And one of the things I'd be interested to hear you talk about was this idea that we heard from businesses about the need for a kind of tripartite EU, UK and business communication roundtable that I kind of thought was happening, but it sort of isn't really in a formal way. Does that hold something of an answer, do you think? I think that would help a lot because it is all about the practicalities as we learned on that visit. And I think what, what came across to me is there are certain items where the EU has a point. Um, diseases of oranges or plants. And the supermarket we were talking to said, well, look, if you could identify what those are, then maybe we could have a different arrangement for them. But for the vast bulk of our products, we only sell to United Kingdom. We only sell in Northern Ireland. And, you know, the worst that can happen is someone drives to, to Derry from Donegal, does their weekly shopping, and takes a chicken sandwich back to the fridge and some meat in the freezer. But I, I don't see that you can argue that that really undermines the integrity of the single market. The second thing is we have a standoff at the moment 
because the government has, in effect, continued to unilaterally extend the grace periods. The EU began uh, legal action against the UK because it was not abiding by the uh, terms of the protocol, but has stayed that while they try and negotiate an outcome. And what appeared to be a very pressing deadline has now moved further and further out. And in a way, um, the longer that carries on, the more you see whether there is, in fact, a problem or not, and, and maybe a, a pragmatic solution could be found. So time is sometimes a way of dealing with a problem by not forcing the issue. Well, what's very interesting with that is that, that sense of, and I know one of the recommendations of, of the Commission touches on this, an equivalence of standards, particularly if you're talking about agricultural, horticultural goods. And um, where that leaves us interestingly is it makes me wonder with the government is, is whether farmers will be only too aware, and I gave it very much come back to, to, to Welsh farming, which is it's, it's dependent on, on, on sheep and cattle, on red meat, is that to be able to sell to our, again, our nearest neighbours, they are going to have to implement equivalence of standards anyway, because otherwise they're going to have problems. But then the interesting question comes in, if you're going to effectively, through the back door, impose that requirement on our farmers so that there's no, if you like, from the farmer's point of view, benefit to Brexit because they're still abiding by the same standards, but then accept in, say, meat through a free trade agreement with Australia or New Zealand or wherever, which is produced to a lower standard and is cheaper, you're actually putting UK farmers in a, in a very invidious position where they're producing to one level and being undercut to another. But And also you feel that the government is allowing themselves the rhetoric of saying that their advantage is to Brexit but who's actually carrying the costs. And I know that the farmers' unions and many of their representatives who've spoken to us have raised exactly that point. Yeah, well, we touched on just two areas there, isn't there? One is, is it politically realistic to ask the British government to do some kind of SPS veterinary agreement, given that, you know, some kind of equivalence agreement, which, which we don't have at the moment, and one of the reasons why there's so much friction and pain for food products of all sorts going into the EU and into Northern Ireland because we don't have that veterinary agreement. One of the recommendations in, in the report is we should have that agreement. You're both politicians, you're both people of the world. Is it, can you square that agreement with the idea behind Brexit? Well, it depends how the equivalence, the SPS agreement works, because the EU's opening is to say, well, we have to have what's called dynamic alignment. In other words, every time we change our rules, you've got to change all of yours. Now, there may be areas where the, the UK thinks we don't actually need to ban this ingredient in this product because we can't see what the harm is. So there's an issue of principle, there's an issue of practicality. But the longer we don't get some kind of agreement and the more there is divergence, and that really came across during our visit talking to the supermarket, more and more divergence makes it harder and harder for them to supply the Northern Ireland market because how can you have two separate chains of goods? One's for GB, one for, the, uh, for Northern Ireland in those uh, circumstances. And I think it would make a lot of sense. Indeed, I asked uh, one of the Northern Ireland ministers about that in the House of Commons last week. Is it the government's wish to negotiate an SPS agreement? And I didn't get... An answer. And I think part of the problem is that in saying they got Brexit done, the government is also saying we've negotiated an agreement that we liked, it cannot be improved upon, it must be perfect. And every recommendation that we are making, every issue we are pointing to, every problem we have identified is saying, well, actually, you know, we could do better than this. And that is a political problem for the government to admit, yeah, well, we could do better by artists and we could do better for SPS and we could reduce some of the red tape and bureaucracy that's particularly affecting small businesses. And it all comes back down to politics, doesn't it? And where the levers are that allow the government to move, because he's interested with the sanitary, phytosanitary, but that zones obviously across the whole of the island of Ireland, because it would be, wouldn't it? But in that case, if we can, if we can countenance for the island of Ireland, then surely that's something we should be count, able to countenance for a, a further afield than that, because the common sense approach to it is so obvious. It does, get, it does get very complicated. One of the examples just recently, the British government gave an emergency authorization for new nicotinoid uh, um, pesticides for sugar beet. Uh, also used, it, I think, in rapeseed. Um, so then you have a situation, one of the things we heard was, if a product is made from sugar, that's made from sugar beet, which has higher levels of neonicotinoid residue in it than is permissible in the EU, 
can that product be exported to Northern Ireland? And one of the reps that we spoke to, industry reps we spoke to, said we couldn't get an answer to that question. The Food and Standards Agency didn't know. So you, you, you can see how the, the more divergence you get, the more infinitely complicated um, it becomes. I mean, it's interesting that Edwin Poots himself, you know, who's agriculturist, and wrote to the British government and said, if you don't do some kind of SBS deal, the protocol won't work. You know, and you can argue that actually on the food and drink stuff, given that the protocol is not being fully applied at the moment, um, that he was almost certainly right about that. Um, more broadly, when you look at standards, one of the things I hear most consistently, and, and you mentioned again in this report, industry and business is this business about where the UK has different standards almost for its own sake. And I'm thinking of the UK... CA mark, this equivalent to the C mark. And if you look on the back of your phone, it's got one of these C marks for standards. And the UK is creating its own kind of copycat regime. Um, I think because if you listen to the government, we're going to have our own standards, except that standards are international. In the vast majority of cases, there's no obvious upside to having these standards. So, so should we basically give up on the UK CA mark? Is, is, that, is that where the commission is, do you think? It seems to me it's about trying to have something to point to. This is a benefit of Brexit, uh, which is the other example, chemicals, where the government said, right, we're going to set up our own British version of REACH uh, for certification of chemicals. And they've now delayed it again, because uh, when I was chairing the select committee, the chemicals industry came and said, this is going to cost us a shed load of money for absolutely no benefit whatsoever. So it comes back to this central question to what extent do you actually have a long list of things on which you wish to diverge? And it always struck me that the argument about divergence is something that Theresa May pointed out early on, um, was more about the principle than the practicality, unless there's a really important issue where you feel very strongly that we should do things rather differently. And the same is true for trading with the rest of the world. When we sell cars to the United States of America, we make them to meet the highest standard which is in California, because as long as it can get into California, it can be sold in the rest of the United States of America. So industry, I think, feels very frustrated about this because they don't think they've been listened to throughout the whole Brexit process because ultimately politics triumphed over the economic interests of the country. And that's why the, the OBR said, well, there's going to be a hit to GDP. And at a time when we got a cost of living crisis, uh, economic difficulty, um, who would want to inflict that on your own economy? Well, I'm afraid that's what's happened, which makes it even more important that we find ways of easing the relationship, facilitating trade, because it's in our interest as well as that of our European neighbours. And then it would certainly seem that there is an opportunity now for the government to do that. It would be very interesting to see, in a sense, the government can make flagship statements now in relation to, sadly, to Ukraine. The government doesn't need to make flagship statements about Brexit anymore. And... One would hope, and also from the voice of, of, of business, which I think, if I can just go off on a slight tangent with that, I think the voice of business, which we have been able to hear and give a, some publicity to, it is a tragedy that that wasn't heard earlier on. Again, I mean, forgive me for doing this sort of meta conversation yeah. about the nature of politics, but politics is not a spectator sport. And it, you get this sense that there were... There were great spokespeople within business who were almost holding their nose because they didn't want to get engaged with politics back in 2016 and the run-up to that. And now, through the commission, we've been able to hear people. But I would very much hope that the government sees their opportunity now to come off their high horse in relation to Brexit and actually make some practical decisions because otherwise the degree of suffering... If I can come back again just to my own... Being a constituency MP, as we all are... We know how difficult it's going to be. We know what the cost of energy is going to be like. We know what the cost of transport is going to be like. We know what the cost of food is going to be like. Well, we, to be honest, we don't, but we know it's going to become worse. We know it's become more difficult. The government has an opportunity now to behave in a different way and to approach everything that the Commission is, being discuss is discussing in a way in which it keeps face as well. And I really do hope that that opportunity is taken. That's important, because it, as, as you were saying, one of the most amazing things about Brexit is that um, I, I can't think of another example of a major country doing a major trade deal with its by far its largest trading partner, pretty much in defiance of the advice 
of its traders. Right? It, was an, it was an extraordinary situation to find yourself in because, you know, Brexit, the whole obsession with sovereignty over, uh, you know, prioritizing sovereignty, sovereignty is always a, you know, it's a balance. You, know, you, give, you give bits of elements of sovereignty away for, for you know, Article 5 of NATO. You give away, you know, some sovereignty there in order to protect yourself. And, and that, it became very adversarial, didn't it? And so, and so, you know, the question is, as you say, whether we can get off that adversarial air and get back into the, into the nitty gritty. We're going to talk for another five minutes. I'm also going to throw the, um, throw the floor open to questions. So if you have questions, um, send them in and uh, they'll be relayed to me and I'll, I'll get them uh, to the commissioners. Um, we talked, we've talked about goods, we've talked about standards, we've talked about Northern Ireland. Of course, services is a big part of UK trade, and a lot of it um, took place virtually or not at all as a result of COVID, because none of us could travel. Things are opening up now. Hilary, you mentioned musicians. Um, I wonder how you see professional services going and wh where the commission, what the commission would like to see in order to facilitate professional services. I mean, it's notable that there is no mobility chapter in this deal, um, trade deals often don't do much for services. But is there, is there something, if we can find this new spirit of pragmatism that can, should be done in order to improve um, the flow of services uh, in and out of Europe? Well, I hope that that will be possible. But of course, this was a, a great export surplus of ours, the United Kingdom. And I think the other, the other issue is that increasingly goods and services come together. So if you buy a, an engine from Rolls-Royce, you're not basically, you're renting the engine and the servicing of it that comes with the engine. And if the engine can't be fixed, then Rolls-Royce will ship you another one and you'll stick it on your plane and you can carry on flying. So the, what was a rigid division in the past between services and goods is being uh, eroded. And I think, however, it's also the case that because of COVID, we haven't yet seen the full impact of the change relationship and so that'll take a lit, a, a bit longer to work its way out of the system but the the example of performers and artists and musicians is a really good one to start with because is it not in the interests of the eu and us to be able to allow these industries well which we happen to be incredibly strong in the united kingdom this is one of our the jewels in our crown of our economy um surely we can reach some sort of agreement. And I'm afraid there's been an argument about who offered what during the negotiations, but that's in the past. The question now is, how can we make it easier for people to go on doing what they do, do brilliantly and love, which is to you know, bring joy and entertainment uh, and laughter to audiences both ways across the channel? And the, the, the industry here in the UK is working with parliamentarians to try and persuade the government to open up a negotiation with the EU about this and for the EU to respond positively, which I hope they would. And you do feel that, again, in this sort of um, Legoland of politics in which we've existed until certainly very recently, possibly still, the sense of the, the fear of the words freedom of movement have overridden everything else. And if, if you could possibly attach the term freedom of movement to it, that was per se a bad thing. I mean, certain areas, we talk about the STEM areas, perhaps have had a high, higher priority. But um, again, and forgive me, because it does feel like we are living in a time now where there is change. Even we'll, we'll probably be talking later on today in Westminster in the chamber about um, the refugees, uh, the visa, visa support scheme or the sponsorship scheme, that actually that sense of people moving may possibly be a change, there may be a change of attitude here as well. But to come back again to, to that sense within the Brexit agreement that that just wasn't a consideration. It was all almost as though we were living in the, in the 1950s and it was the sort of import-export regimes that we were talking about then. Um, but of course we weren't. So we are living in the 21st century. So, so, I mean, devil's advocate here, we, we talk about our mutual interests. So one of the things that's been blocked by uh, Brexit uh, and the row over Northern Ireland is the, you know, is the Horizon Europe scheme. 95 billion euros worth of joint uh, uh, scientific research. Um, and I think we say often, or you say often, 
and I think I probably say often, look, it's in our joint interests, in our mutual interests. But Brexit has actually always been pretty adversarial, hasn't it? So when you remember Michel Barnier's speech saying that the UK is not going to be a certification hub off the coast of Europe, that actually, if you look at the way the Commission built the rules of origin, which is the, you know, making the content thresholds to send your stuff into Europe, and they were designed to assist Europe in getting strategic dominance, to encourage European companies to shut British companies out of supply chain. You know, are, are we, you know, Hillary, you're killing yourself here that this is all in our mutual interest. That's not how the EU sees it. But devil's advocate, actually, the EU is, is loving a bit of Brexit, it's squeezing us out of their supply chains. It's to invest in the EU over the UK. It's all a bit of a sort of pipe dream, isn't it, when you look at it from that point of view? Let's not kid ourselves, of course. The EU looked at the negotiations and thought, how can we gain advantage? Financial services, they're desperate to further strengthen their financial services centres. Although on the rules of origin, ironically, this has led to announcements being made about electric car battery manufacture here in the UK, because unless we're making the batteries here, because they're such a big component part of the car, and we sell just under 2,000 cars a day to the European Union, then you would have come up against the rules of origin. So it's, the EU has been working very hard to promote electric uh, battery manufacture in the EU, and now we've got announcements about that being made in the UK. So it's had that, that consequence. Um, but you are right. Of course, everyone's going to look at their own economic interests. But the Horizon programme that you mentioned, that really is in everybody's interest to cooperate. Well, the Commission hasn't moved. Of course not, because it's holding it over the Northern Ireland negotiations, saying, basically, if you're not going to honour a treaty that you signed, well, um, you can go whistle for Horizon. That's another reason why the Northern Ireland negotiations need to reach a sensible conclusion, compromise, in the interests of moving forward, not to jeopardise the uh, Good Friday Agreement, and then hopefully that will unlock scientific cooperation again, which we're very good at. And we see what international cooperation did to help us fight COVID, for goodness sake. So the argument for that is overwhelmingly strong, but it's caught up in the toxic politics of Brexit. I, I want to come back, before we go on to questions, which we will in, in four or five minutes, to... Um, to our own union, not just the European Union, but Brexit um, did repatriate vast amounts of um, competencies from the EU. I'm thinking of subsidy control, I'm right to do subsidy control, um, uh, EU structural funds, 1.5 billion a year, sent back to us, to be clear, not, not a handout, sent back to us as a rebate on our subs uh, uh, to the European Union, distributed at regional level in a very bureaucratic um, scheme. Do you see, when you look at those two areas, subsidy control and what's going to replace EU structural funds, which is the shared prosperity fund, a chance for us to do something better, something nimbler, something better targeted? Um, and Liz, if you answer that question, you can then also um, talk about what it's doing in terms of causing tensions within the setup of the management of the union between the Westminster and the Welsh and Scottish government, and why it's upsetting people so much in Cardiff and Edinburgh. We, as a commission, we had evidence for representatives from the Scottish Parliament, from, from what Scottish government and Welsh government, uh, expressing their concerns about the Internal Market Act, which then, really, if you look at it through the lens of the Shared Prosperity Fund, is exact. It, 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 it shows exactly why those concerns exist. So, if you were to think that if you had a minister charged with developing the economy in in Wales, in Scotland that there is a fair chance that they are closer, with their ear is closer to the ground as what those people who are most engaged with the economy in England and in Wales and Scotland uh, feel is most important to them. And through the Shared Prosperity Fund, of course, what we've seen, and comparing it with the, the previous uh, European structural funds, the one thing that the European structural funds, and they started from a principle of alleviating poverty. So they identified those areas within the EU that were above or below a certain standard in relation to poverty, and the money was directed to those areas on that ground. Now, then how it was spent, it, our experience of that within Wales even, it, it varied immensely. In some places, the, the interaction with local needs was identified clearly. Local communities felt that they, that they were getting duly supported was something that they wanted in some areas, and in other areas, that, that wasn't the case. They felt that it was overly bureaucratic and, and aimed, say, towards certain projects, which they didn't feel would make a difference on the ground. But... The fundamental difference between that and what we now have 
with our experience so far of the Shares Prosperity Fund. Well, firstly, with it, we don't know what the principles no. are. I was going to say, yep. it, it starts in yep. April and the government has yet to publish a prospectus. I'm told it will come um, on the 23rd when the spring statement happens. That's a week before it's due to and start. Our experiences of, of, the, the, of the, the forerunners of the Shared Prosperity Fund has left us a lot more familiar with the word port barrel, the phrase port barrel politics, than we ever were before, because it has been seen to operate at odds with that principle of identifying where de de deprivation is, where poverty is, and target targeting at that. The, and go that the is, government's I mean, argument would be, I mean, it's interesting, Cornwall got a billion euros worth of structural funds. It voted 56.5 to 43.5 for Brexit. Yeah. So, so the government's argument is, because uh, these funds, we do know these funds are going to be dished out at unitary or, or district council level, aren't they? By formula, not by competitive bidding. Um, the government would argue, has argued to me, um, that that's the way to get the money to the grassroots. That's the way to make it land with people in a way that structural funds clearly didn't. If Cornwall voted for Brexit, clearly the message didn't get through. Right. Wales yeah, I, voted I would, for Brexit. Yeah, I, I wouldn't even use voting for Brexit as, as a measure of deprivation in any shape or form in the sense of how we direct money towards another thing. If they say there will be a formula, we await to see. We need to see what the formula is. But our experience so far is that it is not a formula, that it is being used for political benefit, frankly. And that is wrong. Mm. You know, for areas of deprivation should not be money should not be used for, for, for shoring up political advantage or advantages at the next election. I mean, again, you're looking at areas of Wales. I, I obviously will refer to my own constituency. This is the lowest full-time salaries amongst the, in the United Kingdom, and yet somehow or other that county did not qualify for the initial round of, 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 of EU replacement funding from the, from the UK government. Yeah, I mean, is, I, mean I, I, I guess there's a, there's a second argument, which is that although the money in Europe was bureaucratic, it was delivered at the kind of LEP level, wasn't it, the regional level. If you bring it down into kind of district or, or unitary council level, the danger is you then fragment, uh, the people I've talked to will say, you then fragment um, the development policy and you end up with, I think, 22 unitaries in Wales? 22 unitaries. Unitary. So you're going to end up with 22 unitaries, all getting a chunk of this, of this pie, and they're all going to spend it differently. Are they going to spend it in a joined-up way? And, of course, and in, in, in England, you've taken out the capacity so much from local authority even to be able to manage this sort of money effectively. And then, ironically, that we do have government bodies in, in Wales and Scotland and not in the north of Ireland who are capable of, of dealing with the level of uh, the work that you need to do to assess where the money would be best spent. Whether they'll do it politically is another story, but they do have the capacity to do it. And yet this government here in Westminster is intent in sending it down in micromanaging down to a lower level and to avoid that, 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 that higher level of political responsibility. Yeah, we wait and see, don't we? I think it's going to be a really... When we talk about how Brexit lands and, 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 and people's assessment of Brexit, I think how this money is spent is going to be very controversial and, and, and I think, um, you know, really, really interesting. And it is the micro level of this. I and mean, then again... If you look at what central government should be doing, central government should be investing in infrastructure that nobody else will invest in. So if you're talking about the national grid for renewables, you're talking about connectivity with, with, with signal into the future, only central government can do that if you want to do it at a UK level. And yet that's not the way they're approaching it. They're still looking at it in the piecemeal, piecemeal way, which even from Westminster's point of view, and of course they're taking out people like, like the Senate and, 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 and the Scottish Parliament. Fascinating discussion. Thank you both very much. Right, it's done question time now. I'm going to put you on the spot. Um, one thing we haven't really talked about, so I'm going to go straight to Ella from Aberdeen's question. Um, Brexit sent me blind, by the way, reading European Commission documents. <laughs> so I now, can't, I now can't do anything without my glasses. Um, so I'm going to put the gig lamps on. Um, uh, so Ella from Aberdeen makes, makes this question. She said, I've seen a lot of from the government about Australia and New Zealand trade deals that they've signed, but I'm not sure how it actually benefits the UK. Is there anything in there that will actually be good for our economy? And so, and similar question, which has been asked also down there, is is, you know, is there enough participa participation and consultation over this future trade strategy, which impacts, for example, on Welsh land farmers? Um, no, is the answer. Um, oh, look, I think the thing to understand about the trade deals with New Zealand and Australia is that the government was desperate to get them because they were the first two bits of paper they could wave in the air and say, this is a benefit of Brexit, because all the other trade deals were simply rolling over what we already had as members of the European Union. 
Um, and if you talk to farmers, uh, and I have, and, and, and Liz will certainly have done so, uh, they will express concern about where this leaves the, the, the British farming industry. And some of the details are not yet clear. So you've got quantities of, of beef, but is it going to be whole carcass? Is it going to be cuts? And that makes a big impact. I think, secondly, we were told repeatedly the purpose of Brexit is to do a trade deal with the United States of America. I think it's quite clear that until the Northern Ireland Protocol problem is resolved and it can be seen that the Good Friday Agreement is in any way, is not in any way undermined, I don't think Congress is going to agree a trade deal. When we get on, however, if we get to that point uh, uh, to discuss a trade deal with the United States of America, then all of the things that, that Liz was just talking about uh, relating to the powers and responsibilities of the devolved governments and how that relates to a trade deal which is done by the UK as a whole. And there is a, there is a, a dilemma there because the UK sits as one country and negotiates and it's a bit difficult if you say, well, we've agreed the following, but did I point out that you won't be able to export those goods to Wales or to, to Northern Ireland or to Scotland? And you have to find a sensible way uh, of uh, resolving that. But when you sum it all up, and you touched on it yourself, Peter, is this is the first, the TCA was the first trade deal in history where the party that went into it, the UK, knew for certain it would come out with a worse deal than it had previously. And that is that tells you something about Brexit being a political project. Um, it's what you do with your sovereignty in the modern age that counts, but it's undoubtedly had an adverse economic impact. Yeah, it is. I mean, your farmers are sore. You know, there's always winners and losers in trade deals. And to be fair to the government, I'd say the trade arena is actually one area where they've been quite true to the Brexit principles in some ways. In lots of other areas, they've, like, you know, delaying EU reach chemicals and still, dip, you know, on the borders and stuff, they've actually kind of quietly talked big and then acted little. But on the trade stuff, you'd actually say they've, they've kind of stuck to their global Britain guns on that. Is there upsides as well as downsides for well, from the Welsh? Yes, I've got a, a, a in the constituency a, 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 a fantastic small business called Metcalfs, and they um, amongst their businesses is they import um, commercial food processing machines, and they've been doing this before and after Brexit from Australia, and they were saying that the level of tariffs, so that you can see this, this could be a, well be a business where they, there would be an advantage for them to have the the, the, the free trade agreement with Australia. This, it makes no difference to them whatsoever. The, the, the level of tariffs that they lose that, that, that are be, will be removed through the FTA is of no consequence what for them whatsoever. And in fact, the, the work that they do with other European nations when they, when, when they, when they sell them their, their equipment abroad, evidently the, the complications involved with exporting for these, this, the, you know, the, the, they employ about 30 people is, is, is way over. But I think the, the, the interesting point that I would like to make, which, which farmers have raised with me, with both uh, the Australian and the New Zealand FTAs, is uh, particularly in relation to the Australian one, um, if this is what the government will accept now, every other nation with which they negotiate an FDA will look to get a better deal. Yeah. So heaven help us. It's a slippery slope. Um, now, this is the most important question I'm going to ask today, I think, because it's one that I get asked in my life as a journalist all the time. It comes from John, uh, who's in Middlesbrough, and he says, I'm a small business owner. And all the way through Brexit, it's small, but, you know, the big boys have got lawyers, they've got customs agents, they've got cash flow, they've got capacity. I'm a small business owner, and I have really struggled with all the red tape we've had to deal with. I can't afford another staff member to manage it, so I'm doing it all myself. How does the Commission think the government can fix this if we're not going back into the customs union and the single market? So John is realistic. There's a load of things we're not going to do because we're not going to go back. So based on a realistic assessment of what the government's going to do, how can we release the burden on some of these small businesses? Because I know for a fact that they're suffering. I'd say the first thing the government has to do is to accept that there's a problem. And it comes back to my earlier point. Brexit was perfect because they say we negotiated it, cannot be improved upon. And you have, on the one hand, the government saying we wish to get rid of red tape as an article of faith of this government. And on the other hand, it's dumped the biggest load of red tape on businesses, particularly small businesses, in my lifetime. So they have to acknowledge it. And then you have to sit down with the EU and say, can we 
automate more of this process, more support for small businesses. That's one of the recommendations in our report, because businesses need help for precisely the reasons that you've just pointed out. Uh, the questioner has the small businesses don't have the resources and the staff and the expertise to deal with this. And some of them have given up trading with the EU and some EU businesses have given up trading with the UK because they can't be faffed. Yeah, I mean, we, we have been with the all top the 10 paperwork. German trade partners since 1950 and will now be number 11 this year. Liz, what, what, I mean, small businesses become big businesses and a lot of small businesses start out trading with the EU because they could shut stuck chuck stuff in a van in Bangor or in Birmingham and drive it to Brussels or Bonn without let or hindrance. That's obviously completely changed now. Can we do enough to support small businesses to keep them in the game? Or, or do we have to accept defeat, really, that actually I mean, it's a big, big, big business, business now? Trading? If I could just refer just a, a, a few figures for Wales. I mean, 99% of, of Wales businesses are SMEs. So you're, but they're, within that then, 77% of them are micro-businesses. So when we're talking about dedicated staff to deal with export, they're just not there. And then again, particularly in Wales, many of them will depend, many of these businesses will be dependent on one type of export. So when that becomes problematic, they can't shift to another product. It's difficult to do that. So again, what, was, what is the support? I mean, one of our recommendations, as you mentioned, Hillary, is the, the, is the Brexit support fund. For government to realise that there is a problem there, does government have the capacity to support? I wonder, actually, in terms of staff, probably not, not as things stand. But you can't just leave things be because we are going to see businesses failing. But is it a good use of money to throw money at businesses for whom exporting to the EU is uneconomic? You know, as things stand at the moment, the reason these businesses aren't exporting or are stopping exporting is because it's uneconomic. So is it, is it, does it make good sense to throw a load of money to help them do something which you know, thanks to Brexit, is no longer economic to do. Seamlessly, which is what's going to replace them. And there are massive implications. If you're going to say they're un uneconomic and you're not going to support them and you're not going to enable them to do something else, that's a massive question for the government to, to face because it's going to be responsible for it. I guess they have to find UK markets. I mean, it's a genuine question. I think yeah. it's a real, you know, if it doesn't make sense, if, if you know, that we should all be, always be nervous, shouldn't we, about propping up it's one of the first rules about subsidy policy. You can't subsidise non-viable businesses. It's not viable. Businesses are going to have to decide whether it's economic or not to carry on doing what they've been doing. But the very least the government could do in this, these circumstances, having imposed the costs upon them, is to see if they can help them to continue to make that business economic. Yeah. yeah. Um, this is a kind of hybrid question. It's an interesting one. Um, uh, and it comes from Stephanie in Cumbria. Uh, in the light of Ukraine and Brexit, and what's going on, and also I think also with China, it's worth you know considering how relations with China have shifted. You know, given how much of our manufacturing goods and imports come, she says, does the Commission think the government should have a new manufacturing strategy for the UK, considering that global supply chains are facing greater disruption in the future? Do we need a new manufacturing strategy? Well, I'm not sure that we've. So, well, <laughs> well, I'm not sure we've had a manufacturing strategy as a country for a very long period of time. Let's be honest because globalization led to lots of change. You see some onshoring now as a result of some of the factors that you have identified. And Brexit will undoubtedly lead to changes in supply chains. So if it's a, a lot of bother to import something from the EU and you can look to manufacture that part here in the United Kingdom, then some UK manufacturing businesses will do uh, precisely that. So there's that issue. And secondly, there's identifying what are the strategic industries. Now, I would argue farming is a strategic industry. Steel is a strategic industry. Um, uh, PPE equipment is a strategic industry because that really showed up that the, the view where we can always go shopping in the global supermarket doesn't really work when you have a crisis on. And I think that will lead to a, a reconsideration I mean, our strengths are in advanced and high-tech manufacturing, in the digital sector, in the creative industries. All countries should play to their strength. But I do think we're going to see some readjustment uh, as a result of what's going on in the world, including the impact of Brexit. Very much the awareness of critical supply chains. Yeah. And I think, I mean, we, none of us thought that we, none of us were aware of how significant carbon dioxide was for preserving meat. 
let alone fertilizer. Yeah. And then we suddenly found that it is immensely significant. I think um, certainly discussing the agriculture bill in Wales, um, whether food production will become a public good uh, because the, the, the security of supply of food, whether that's going to be where the agenda in a way that it wasn't even five weeks ago. Yeah. And climate change, making the... There was a net zero, quick question in there as okay. well, actually. So, yeah, go, yeah. Well, only, only to say that we know we've got to make this change. I, I see that um, Nigel Farage has used the moment of the invasion of Ukraine to come out in favour of a referendum on net zero. I'm not quite sure what the question would be. I think if King Canute had tried to have a referendum on whether the tide should come in, he would have ended up... Not referendums it, already, I Yeah, I, well, I agree with you entirely, but we're going to need to manifest new forms of home heating. We're going to have to install them. Um, what an opportunity for British manufacturing and what an opportunity to create jobs. So getting on with this will be good for British industry and for incomes and for families. But again, it depends on what principles the government operates under, because... Yeah, these for very many, many communities, are, we've talked about heating, heating homes, the cost of that, I mean, forgive me again referring to my constituency, I have many upland terrace built houses that were built at the time of the quarries, they were difficult to heat then, they're becoming even more difficult to heat now, particularly if there's no coal. Um, security of supply, do we have a government that is happy to let hill farmers, people with an ill heated housing, go to the wall and suffer, or will they step in? And really, it's a matter of time for the government, are they, to, 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 to use a commonly used phrase, will they indulge in, 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 in disaster capitalism when there will be people who will be able to walk in and make the best out of the massive changes that we're facing, but through which many people will be, and businesses will be destroyed? Or will they actually ensure that the, the, the bare necessities that we need for the poorest people in society to survive, to keep that integrity within our society and our communities, it's quite a big challenge. There are so many big challenges. We've come pretty much to the end of our discussion. Um, we've got a minute or so left. Um, the Commission has produced a thumping great report, which can, by the way, be downloaded. Go on the website. It's a good read. Um, so closing thoughts from you both. Also, with a, with a look forward, is this it for the Commission? Um, what next for the Commission? Well, we're going to carry on with our work because there's so many areas to look at and we will continue to make practical recommendations and hope against hope for the moment, but a moment will come when the politics will change and then I think there will be politicians on, on both sides of the channel who will say, OK, that was the past. Now, what can we do that's going to be in our mutual interest? And in the end, a trade agreement has to be about mutual interest and i think there's a, a we identified that there was a gap uh there wasn't a body that was looking at what the impact of the new trading relationships was going to be the commission has has filled it thanks to the support of best for britain and we're going to carry on doing what we've been doing which is to listen to people take the evidence make the recommendations and try and persuade government and others to act and of course then there is a set of recommendations the way in which the commission has operated it is, it's been in the same way that the, the membership of the Brexit Select Committee operated, wasn't it, that it was a cross-party membership. That's a very healthy way of operating. We may have to argue amongst ourselves on some things, but it, then you, you bring those recommendations with an assumption of engagement and ownership within members within each party. And that then, hopefully, that we ask, you know, a, a shift in politics as... as, as in that whatever way this is caused, for whatever reason, but th there will then be a set of recommendations which we can keep on hammering on at now, and we have them ready to go, hopefully, in future. Yeah. Tremendous. Well, I look forward to the next annual report. Um, I think that's it from us. Uh, Liz Savile Roberts, Hilary Benn, thank you both very much for fascinating uh, conversation, and um, go download that report.